Welcome to the FYD Podcast. I'm here with Cynthia Trada of Mendix. And um, Mendix is a software development company that mm -hmm. helps teach people the soft skills or the, maybe the hard skills of software mm -hmm. development to get into the field, correct? Um, let me uh, restate that. They accomplish that goal because they are an amazing rapid application development platform. Mm -hmm. So you can both develop and deploy um, with Mendix. We have tremendous relationships uh, with SAP, uh, with IBM, and you can you know create apps integrating that data with those companies. Uh, last year we were bought by Siemens for good reason, mm -hmm. because we can really help professional developers uh, develop more quickly, very, very quickly. It's um, We have both a no-code and a low-code platform, so it's very visual at one end, and it can be um, an easier IDE on the other. So we have that, um, and that's on the professional side. But what I think Mendix really brings to the marketplace is taking citizen developers. So take that BA who's maybe an Excel power user that maybe has even moved over to Access a little bit. Take that person and give them this tool, and it is unbelievable unbelievable what work they can do. They can create um, an app from an Excel workbook, not a sheet, a workbook, um, bring it into a working app, and then use that either as a means to communicate um, to upper management, here's an idea I had, and here's a working prototype, not just a couple cute drawings in um, in Visio or, or PowerPoint, but something that actually functions. And then the more complex things, like maybe pulling in some APIs or, or REST, you know, whether it's a REST API or a Google Map, I can flip it over to the low-code IDE and have a more professional developer take it from there. So it really bridges the gap between the lack of communication sometimes on the business side and over on the IT side, which is why the name came up, as a matter of fact. Mendix is to mend that relationship between business and IT. And it really does an outstanding job as well as addressing a skill gap out there in the population. That's fantastic. So you are the customer success manager, one of, yes. right? Uh -huh. uh, how did you get into that? Were you always into technology? Were you always into software? Uh, you know, because that's that's maybe a, not necessarily a new title, but it's yes. it's not. It's it might be vague, right? Mm -hmm. I think right, that it right. could be different between company to company. Sure, customer success managers came out of the SaaS uh, world. So when you have software as a service um, and you are relying on somebody's monthly subscription or annual subscription at the B two B level, so. Um, Spotify always has to give value, otherwise you're going to cut off the cable, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's Spotify or any cable service. So business to business operates the same way. You no longer just buy one lump uh, price of software, you're, you're subscribing every month. So as a SaaS company, you want to keep those customers happy so they continue to subscribe. And therefore the role of customer success managers came along. And that works great for SaaS companies on, on the SaaS side of the house. Um, Mendix really is unique in the marketplace of low-code in that we have a university program, which means just like Microsoft benefits and students benefit by learning Excel on campus in a curriculum as part of a professor's course, um, Mendix likewise has a similar benefit. We um, really believe students will be better off learning low code while they're in college. It will inform their careers going forward. And by doing that, we can um, go to over 130 universities right now and help uh, continue to elevate this curriculum within their coursework. Okay, and and again, how did you get into that, oh, right? Because sure. your your career path is a little interesting. It right? is. It's 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 um it's a broken road, as yeah. some would say. <laughs> um, so I start out as an English major. Um, I was a first generation professional. I am a first generation mm -hmm. professional. So fortunately, my parents definitely believed in going to college. Mm -hmm. um, they really didn't know how to help me after that. Okay. And uh, so I really um, struggled, to be honest. I floated around from retail to temping. I mean, it was really um, humiliating, to mm -hmm. be honest, um, because you'd always hear the potential word, like, but you had so much potential, but you're sure. so smart. Um, why can't you figure this out? So um, one day I just, and this was a, a while back, um, I opened up a paper, the newspaper, I saw an ad for a systems analyst. Honestly, couldn't understand one word in that ad. Um, but I thought, you know what? I'm going to figure it out. And so I called the number and I said, I have no idea what this is, 
I think I could do it in three years. Do you have a junior position I could take where I could learn? Mm -hmm. And remarkably, they said yes. Oh, interesting. And wow. that weird little coincidence in my life um, really brought me to IT. Um, and I learned so much over those 13 years. Again, walked into this um, IT department of a, of a large regional bank, uh, not knowing what a test environment was, not knowing the difference between batch and online and um, really saw so much that had grown over those 13 years and I had grown as well with it. Um, after that, I had the lucky coincidence of following a passion and I will describe, um, I will warn everybody off of this. <laughs> and no, not, I mean, um, I just think first of all, the whole advice of following your passion is misguided. Okay. Uh, Cal Newport says it far more eloquently in a lot of his work and so I completely agree with him. First of all, it's rather self-centered. Mm -hmm. You know, it's what I want. Um, I'm not checking to see does the marketplace need it. Um, you know, am I looking at what I can give or what I can get? So that's one of my main reasons for cautioning people against the, the passion. The other thing is a lot of people don't know what their passion is, so then they worry about it and wonder what's wrong with them. And you don't always know because how many 18-year-olds know more than 10 jobs in their life? They know teacher, doctor, nurse, a few things like that, but how many of them know what a UX person does? Sure, sure. You know, yeah, well, and there's, there's all sorts of esoteric software jobs. Exactly, right? exactly. So if you don't have the luxury of being in a family or in a neighborhood or, or in a bubble mm -hmm. that knows those things, you think there isn't a place for you sometimes. And so the more you just get in there and try things and figure out, do I like this enough to work at it and get good mm -hmm. at it? Um, then, then that that's, that pays off, and that's I think what happened with me. I I got into this field, and I can't say I loved it to begin with. A lot of people say that, mm -hmm. and they're right. Um, but the more you dig in, and sometimes it's just the fact that you liked working with some people, and you really admired how smart they were and what they could accomplish. Maybe you liked the fact that you made somebody's life easier. Mm -hmm. Maybe you loved the bubble that went, you know, the light bulb that went off when they saw that oh wow, I don't have to dig through all this data. I can learn how to run an Excel macro and it crunches us all faster for me. Yeah. Um, so that can be the gateway drug. And I really think of Mendix as a gateway drug. Okay, So into software, software development, Yes, right? absolutely. So one of the things I love when I go onto campuses, occasionally I'll do guest lectures, and I oftentimes am in the required intro to MIS class. Okay. And um, I'll walk in there and I'll say, you know what? You know, some of you are in here because you know you are going to major in IT and uh, computer science. Computer science, not even management um, information systems. You know that? Great. Mendix is, um, is ready for you. Some of you are here because you're not quite sure, and Mendix is a great place to explore. And some of you are here because you absolutely have to be, and you can't wait to be done with this course. And guess what? We have a way for you to build as well without using any mm -hmm. code. So you might have a great idea, but so many times great ideas are dependent on a decent app to go with them. If you can't build that app, if you can't scale that app to an enterprise level, um, then you can't realize that, that potential business. So I love the fact that I can start you where you are and I can take you as far as you want to go. If you say, you know what, this is plenty for me. Just show me the no code. I just want to build a prototype to have somebody else do it. Not a problem. But if on the other hand, you want to really see what's under the engine, um, how the sausage is made, uh, we can take you all the way to architecture with Mendix. So I love the fact that um, it allows people to try it out in a really quick win initially way. and. And then if they want to keep going and be challenged, that's terrific. And if it's enough, it's enough. They've still gone, they've gone mm -hmm. a, decent, a decent mile. That's interesting because I've always looked at the passion uh, question as more of like, because like in my head, it's really hard to be passionate about being like a dentist, for example, yeah. right? It's like yeah. you're looking at people's teeth all day, maybe, right. maybe, and that's just not what I'm hardwired for. Right. But when I look at something and I see the, the, the overarching concepts, like mm -hmm. problem solving. Yes. I like problem solving. Mm -hmm. So... That could be IT. That could also be, you know, restructuring, you know, a house. Right. right? So right. There, there's a couple different ways you can go about that. Right. But yeah, like it's hard to. There's a lot of problems that we need to solve. Right. 
that are hard to be passionate about. Absolutely. You, right. And sure. I think that's a, that's another interesting way of looking at it because I, I, I would agree that, you know, lo- only trying to do something you're super passionate about, mm-hmm. like down to the letter, yes. if that's like a, like a sport comes to mind. Right. Like, Absolutely. How much value are you really bringing? Like everyone can't be a basketball Absolutely. player. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right. That's a great example. The other thing too, the research um, that Cal Newport has done is he has three C's for what makes somebody um, really happy at work. Mm-hmm. Um, number one is competence. You want to be good at what you do. Mm -hmm. Um, Two is um, control. When you're when you're good at a rare and valuable skill you have the control to be able to say I don't want to work on Fridays anymore Mm -hmm. and you will have somebody who will accept your schedule Monday through Thursday Mm -hmm. or you have the the means to leverage that it's your career currency. Now whether you want to spend it on a salary, whether you want to spend it on time, whether you want to spend it on title or working remotely or whatever it is, once you have that high level of competence in a rare and valuable skill it really leverages a lot for you. And the third C is about community and being able to have a connection at work that is meaningful to you. That is um, that is shown to be a greater predictor. All three of those C's are greater predictors of happiness in your career than following your passion. That's great. And this was totally an unplanned conversation, yes. but I want to uh, I want to also bring up so Naval Ravikant. I'm probably butchering his last name, but mm-hmm. he's he's kind of bigger in the crypto community okay. uh, and big in the angel investment uh, community. Recently, uh, started a tweet that's caused quite a debate. Whereas uh-huh. you're either there are two types of people: people mm-hmm. that are uh, seeking attention, yes. or people that are seeking money, uh-huh. right? And yes. and so my in- initial reaction was, well, why not both? Yeah. But but the argument that he's making is, at its core, you'll either pick one over the other. You'll either okay. pick more, and attention is, is a negative connotation to it, but it could just be status. Okay, yes. It could be like uh, it, any kind of virtue signaling. Like I say, you know, like I'm drinking water, not pop, right? Mm-hmm. That could be a form of like, look, like I am of a, a you know, water yes. drinking culture yes. or status. Yes, Right, so he's like, oh. everything you do is either to pick a status or to pick a money. And, mm-hmm. the, and very few people are 100% about money. There's a point where they'll pick the status over the money, oh, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And and obviously everyone had their, their it's Twitter, so it's just yep. a bunch of people stating their beliefs and uh, how he's wrong, or you know, uh, one of my the things that made me chuckle was the first comment was, "You need to get out more, man," because <laughs> it's just because he, he, you know he, a lot of his tweets are very like deep philosophical, just like but like you know thought provoking yeah. statements. So the first thing is just like just go outside, go for a walk, right? You know? Right. Yep. But um. I guess, do you, do you agree with that? What, what, what is your take on that? Um, wow. Um, money or status? I think it's so simplistic to look at those mm-hmm. two answers, to be honest. And maybe I'm just not very good at multiple choice answers. Sure. Um, so I, I guess I don't have a strong opinion on that. Yeah. Um, I think... Uh, I mean, to me, if I, when I work with job seekers, for example, mm-hmm. to try to understand what would be a nice fit for them, where they would um, flourish, uh, honestly, we, we talk a little bit about money, you know, to mm-hmm. understand, like, what do you need, um, you know, and have you done your salary research? But um, I really am a huge fan of the Gallup strengths as a way of understanding where people are more likely to be happy. Or one thing I I tell people um, when creating an interview bucket list, I'm a huge fan of this strategy. And this is when you asked me earlier about how I got to Mendix. Part of it is that that broken road. But then um, there became a point where I, I actually got pretty darn good at figuring out um, where I would fit, um, who needs me, and um, you know, some would say at a certain point in your life uh, you might face ageism. I'm, I, I don't believe in that, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, that's because if you put all those other go-to-market strategies in place, that won't be an issue. Um, but going back to um, the the interview bucket list is, a, is mm-hmm. one of those strategies. So for example, if I'm working with somebody and they do believe in either the money or the status thing, then their interview bucket list of companies that they'd like to work for will reflect that. Mm-hmm. And so we can certainly craft that. Uh, there are other ways to do it. The example I usually use is um, the college process. So let's say you were lucky enough to go to a nice posh high school where there was one college counselor for every 25 seniors, something like that. They would typically counsel you to pick about 10 schools you'll apply to, and a third of them will be reach schools, a third will be likely, and a third will be safety. This is typically based on your grades, on your um, scores, and and your extracurriculars, and anything else. 
So you put that together and, um, and you work on the process with this um, counselor. So similarly, the interview bucket list works the same way. Mm -hmm. So for example, for me, you know, if I wanted to pick like an Ivy, I would say I want to work for Google, you know, or Microsoft or something like that. Like, uh, based on that broken road, the odds, that's good. Those are stretch goals for sure. Depending uh, on what you do, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and then on the other hand, um, you know, you could pick a safety like, okay, I'm going to go for, um, you know, a call center position at, you know, some huge company that needs call center reps all the time. So that might be my safety um, for, for somebody. But everybody, just like if they were every student who has that conversation with a counselor, has a different conversation. It could be because of the size of the organization, college or business. It could be commute time. It could be so many things. So um, that interview bucket list is a really helpful way to determine that answer to that question. That was really concise, especially when I threw you that curveball with the binary, so I'm impressed. Um, when, you, when you look at the Mendex, and obviously it's, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison to these, these coding boot camps, sure. but how, what is the role in that, in that environment that Mendex plays sure. as opposed to uh, like a tech elevator or a week encoder. Okay, um, I thankfully we need all of the above. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, a tech elevator and week encoded and any of the other. There's a there are lots of other boot camps in town, um, and across the country virtually as well. So I think um, they definitely you know they've been successful in so many ways, and I think that's terrific. We need those people. Um, I think Mendex does a great job in taking a company that has chosen to buy Mendex and saying, I'm going to retool people here. I'm going to take somebody who's been right at the edge of being a super user of our existing software and know that they have the capability of, 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 of being productive in Mendix. So that's one, one part of it. Um, I'm going to hire that new grad because I just bought the software and I need some grads to, to help me yeah. run it. In addition to my seasoned developers who are there who can get them through the um, points of of the development that they don't know enough about. They might not know enough about um, the software development life cycle. So by having these experienced people on the team, um, everybody is growing. So, um, so those are some very, very cool things about how, um, so I think on the one hand, you can upskill people a lot, or you can take existing people and not have to upskill them as much, and then you've got a larger pool of, of candidates. And when you're looking at like workforce development issues, sure. right? Uh, it's, Cleveland, in, specific, in, yeah. in, uh, in, in particular, mm -hmm. has a workforce development issue sure. when, it, when it pertains to IT. Right. Uh, I especially feel this with cybersecurity mm -hmm. talent, but uh, surely as software development becomes more and more prevalent yes. and all companies need software development, mm -hmm. not just tech companies, yes. what do you see kind of fixing that problem for sure. us? Uh, some of the blockers I see, on the one hand, I see candidates who swipe left on IT. Okay. And um, because what we talked about earlier, they have 10 careers they think of, and all they picture is some white dude in a hoodie mm -hmm. um, in a corner. And they don't realize all the cool things around that. It yes. could be a white dude in a suit in a corner. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I think part of it is that, um, oh, it's not for me. Right. So if you can't see yourself in it, that's a little bit of it. The other part of it is in college, it's high stakes. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't go into computer science, a computer science major, um, you know, and it's one of those weed out majors. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you're not going to risk your GPA on that. So you might shift over to management information systems, which is still not a bad option, and you still might eventually become more technical than you realize, or you opt out completely and end up, you know, nothing wrong with the liberal arts, love those sure, liberal sure. arts. But, but there's it, too many of them. Well, and if you <laughs> and if you got there out of fear, yeah. then it's unfortunate that we mm -hmm. scared you away from something that was of interest to you. So I think that's another part of it. So that swipe left feeling. Um, the other thing is, again, traditional coding, you miss one character and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And it's so frustrating, um, which again is one of the reasons um, I love Mendix. It's coding without the BS. Mm -hmm. And you get to have success. I mean, literally, I am on a campus and within 60 minutes, I have students with working apps. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, well, and that's, that's just kind of showing you how, uh, how streamlined coding is. Right. Just, uh, you know, a lot of people say that uh, coding is thinking, mm -hmm. but like with technology. Yes. And I, and I subscribe to that thought more and more, mm -hmm. the more I see it. And, and on that vein, that's why I think we need a lot more people doing that. Yeah. And so one issue that I see kind of coming about 
more and more is automation kind of taking yep. jobs away. Right. And I think that the great answer, the great equalizer to that is we're going to have all these thinkers yes. that we need in the workplace. Mm -hmm. We need to take those people whose jobs are being automated and turn them into thinkers yeah. and thinkers are coders. Right. And uh, so, so you, I guess my, my question is, do you agree with that? And I do. Is that, is that the I way do. to go? Um, I mean, it's, you know, a lot of people will say that's a huge leap to go from, you know, um, one kind of role to this kind mm -hmm. of role. It is a huge leap. Some people can make that leap better with a tech elevator mm -hmm. or a week encode it. Some can make that leap better at college and some can make that leap better on the job where they can really see direct application to their work. For example, um, we have a university in the UK, University of Westminster, and mm -hmm. we introduced them to one of our clients, Chubb Insurance. And so these students are l literally working on an app for Chubb Insurance and all of them said it really increased their motivation, increased their um, their interest because it was it wasn't something theoretical, it wasn't an assignment, it was something that uh, a professional was depending on from them. And so they really stretched themselves and none of them had any coding background whatsoever. Yeah. And they all were working in our IDE, so Visual Studio, and, um, and really producing something remarkable for Chubb. So we really believe that can happen and uh, a lot of people prefer to see that direct, a, a great example. You might show somebody Excel and they just yawn. Mm -hmm. But if you show them Excel around the time that they're planning a wedding, right. and they can now organize their guest list and their shower list and all those things and so many elements of, um, of that significant event, suddenly Excel becomes more interesting to them. And so many people don't don't understand the extent of what Excel can do. Oh, like gosh. truly, Excel yeah. is the great answer to blockchain, right? I, like yes, I leave, don't, I mean, I will. I've said for years, if you yeah. could, took away every piece of software and only gave me one pick, it would be Excel. Excel. I could, mm -hmm. Excel. Absolutely. Yeah, you could do just about. You could do a lot with that. You could do most business absolutely tasks with it. You could you could create a slide deck out of it. If sure, you, you, you know, do you could, obviously you, any word thing. Any word thing. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, if if they took it all away and only gave you Excel, absolutely, you could yeah. do it. Yeah, that's always that's always fascinating. So, going back to the automation yes. thing, I, I, and I deal with a lot of people working in machine learning, AI, deep learning. Yeah. Uh, it's getting there. Yeah. Uh, logistics is the first area where people are getting out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that we can reteach mm -hmm. almost every truck driver that wanted to yeah. uh, coding yes. within a month, mm -hmm. and I really do. And okay. and the reason is because uh, I want to share the story with you, and I don't. Remember what boot camp he went through, mm -hmm. so I can't I can't name it. Uh, but I had a I had a friend that I met in the gym. Uh, we did MMA, he goes to the gym I do MMA at, and um, he had some hardships. He mm -hmm. he got in trouble with some legal things. Came out of that, and he kind of needed work, mm -hmm. right? And yes. so he went through one of these programs, yes. and within I think it was six weeks, yes. he had a, he had a job at at a at a local. Um, Tech a software development yes. company that did background checks. Yes. Oddly enough, yes, and, I know uh, exactly who this person. Is. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> they he I mean he did fantastic through it, yep. and now he's I mean he's he's jumped I think from that time mm -hmm. to two other companies yes. each time almost I mean having significant salary increases. Yes. This is a guy that really didn't have. Uh, no, he just didn't. He didn't have a f real formal education. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't have. He never had any proclivity towards software right. development. Certainly, that's not his passion. Nope. Right. But he he had a passion for making things. Still yes. does, and yes. that's that's why he's excelling there. And I think that that really opened my eyes. You know, because prior to that, I don't know if I would have believed the, your pitch that you yes. could you could retrain people. Right. Uh, but seeing that, and again, he, he's he's always been a smart guy, which yes. certainly helps. Sure. But yeah, I mean, you can take just about anyone and make them a, a developer. I, I, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Let me um, share yeah. the spectrum yeah. I observe. Sure. So first of all, you describe somebody who's a disciplined athlete. Mm -hmm. And I will definitely say across the students I've seen um, who are making a transition mm -hmm. uh, and the job seekers with whom I've worked, um, hands down anybody who had that mm -hmm. um, benefit yeah. and that, um, that, that discipline uh, and also employers recognize it. They mm -hmm. recognize, uh, so when somebody says, well, I used to be um, a chef and now I want to be a programmer. Mm 
-hmm. So my question to you, if I were an employer, is should you wrestle? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. well, I would say show yeah, me. Yeah. So, for example, if I really say I want to be a chef, then I will take every opportunity to cook. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to avoid opportunities to cook. Mm -hmm. um, I will go and experiment with different ingredients. I will watch cooking shows. I will mm -hmm. uh, look at cookbooks. All of that tells me you're all in. So if you really tell me that you're all in with becoming a developer, then I better see a GitHub heat map that looks pretty darn green. Yeah. I better see it look like spinach, not like iceberg lettuce. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's one thing. And, um, and, and and you're always looking at those kinds of, so typically I really, I saw that pretty heavily. The, um, the athletes moved quickly through the process because they had the discipline inherent in becoming an athlete. So that is a benefit. Now, I'm not saying if you're not an athlete, forget about it. I'm not. I'm saying that along the continuum, the people who have an easier time, who can take shorter paths like boot camps, um, tend to have that, that ability. Well, it's that discipline of going to yes. practice and, and doing the same repetitious thing right. every day that is sharpening your tools. So true. Now, on the other hand, let's say what's, what your strength isn't so much that, but you love to connect with people. Well, if I see you on the job and how much you like making life easier for somebody, I would take a different path with you. I would look at you and say, instead of saying, I need you to be that disciplined person that, you know, it becomes a coder, I would say, you know what, I notice you really like helping these clients and I, it sounds like they could really use some help with, um, you know, REST APIs and our software. Why don't, um, why don't we plan in a month for you to show them how to do it? And you run that demo and that, that segment, and we'll spend this whole month making sure you're, that you're ready. Mm -hmm. So their motivation is about how they're going to help someone, more so than how I can discipline and uh, be, be disciplined and teach myself a skill. So it's, it's again, this is where the Gallup strengths to me are useful. Sure, sure. Um, everybody can get there, but it's different paths for them depending on what's, m what's meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. And with all these companies that you've been able to work with, mm -hmm. through Mendex or otherwise, yes. what kind of applications are you, are you seeing built? Oh, like, gosh. I mean, are you seeing things built for mostly like power plants or things okay. built for healthcare? Like, what, what sure. kind of trends are you seeing? That's great. Um, so we see our verticals are throughout. Um, uh, the Netherlands, we've got a really strong vertical, vertical in government. Mm -hmm. um, in the UK, our strongest vertical is financial services. Mm -hmm. um, we, yeah, I mean, so we are vertical agnostic. Uh, from a technology perspective, I love the fact that, you know, we are absolutely um, involved in, in AI, and I get to see all your signs here, AI yeah. and IoT. Yeah. Um, the fact that Siemens bought us last year uh, is definitely means we'll be doing a ton in IoT. Right, yeah, you're, you're now in manufacturing. Yes, Welcome. we are manufacturing yeah. more than we'd ever been before, so we're yeah. really excited about that and, and their MindSphere product. So I think there's really um, a ton of excitement there. Um, there are very few places that we have not um, been successful, to be honest. Sure. Uh, so I really, I just, to me, what brought me to Mendix was um, I was looking for something super cutting edge. But honestly, IoT, blockchain just didn't like do it. Right. You know, it was like a, you know, okay. Um, Those are my favorite buzzwords. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you could have them then. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what I, um, what I was, so I was looking for, I knew something I wanted cutting edge. Mm -hmm. I wanted a company that was growing so fast that I could pitch in just about anywhere they needed mm -hmm. me and be useful. And be based in Boston. Yes, well, um, and I had a feeling I'd have a better chance finding this. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in, in this area, it's a lot about healthcare. And mm -hmm. that, again, is an industry that's like, meh. It's, I'm not saying I have to have a passion for it, but I yeah. have to be interested enough to work hard at it. I wasn't interested enough to work hard at it. So it's like, mm, not healthcare. So I thought, okay, my best bet. So a year ago, I knew I was looking for a new um, opportunity. I thought, okay, how do I plan this out? And the first thing I thought was, okay, I want super fast growth. So I looked at, like, the fastest SaaS companies out there or I looked at the Deloitte Fast 500, mm -hmm. and that kind of gave me an idea. And so I winnowed down that list, like the Deloitte Fast 500, it's, um, they've got a couple broad categories. I wanted software. I didn't want um, some of the other ones. Okay. So I picked software, and then I also thought, I'm guessing I'll probably, I, I think I'll end up remote with some travel. Mm -hmm. So I figured I'd probably be better off in the same time zone, the Eastern time zone, rather than picking West Coast companies. Sure. So I winnowed down the list to, to East Coast. So then, um, and I thought, well, based on my background, I think my best role is a customer success role. 
So that's actually what you were looking for. You were yeah. looking for that specific role. I was. Okay. Or, or, some, or like maybe partner success or mm -hmm. something like that. But I had a feeling that's where I would okay. be best deployed. Yeah. And so once I had this interview bucket list put together, um, I had a few on there and I, I took a quick look at them, what they were doing. But uh, what was interesting, I used keywords in Glassdoor, not to apply online because I don't really believe in that, um, but to add more companies to my interview bucket list. And one of the, um, so at first I thought, well, I want cutting edge, but a lot of job descriptions are going to say that. A lot of them will say innovative. Mm -hmm. What's another way to say what I'm looking for? And I realized disruptive. Yeah. So I put in disruptive and remote. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a software as a service term too. Yeah. So you probably got flooded with software companies. Well, actually, the, uh, interestingly enough, the page filled with one company's like twenty openings, okay. and it was a competitor to Mendix. Okay. Interesting. So I thought, oh, and this is the um, the benefit of of being later on in your career. Early in your career, never heard of them. Swipe left. Because mm -hmm. now you say, never heard of them. I wonder what they do. Sure. Sure. So um, I looked at it, and I thought. What's low code? And then I read the Gartner report mm -hmm. and the Forrester report. I thought, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. This is like 10x test automation, yeah. which was really exciting to me 20 years ago. So I thought, this, this is significant. This is huge. So I began to dig in. I went um, the Gartner, the Gartner mm -hmm. Magic Quadrant of uh, low code uh, a year ago. Looked at the five uh, people, uh, five companies in that space and um, went online and, and write everything about them that I could and um, started to pursue this one competitor because of the remote options. I also tried to pursue Mendix and I just kept getting batted away. Like we said, we said Boston, we said yeah. Boston, you know. So they didn't want a remote user? No, remote they did not. Program. They had very few remote positions. They were not mm -hmm. interested at all. Um, in fact, so then I even started um, setting up a, three, a five series meetup so I could get a speaker from each one of these five low-code mm -hmm. companies yeah. and have them come to Cleveland, have one of their speakers come sure. to Cleveland and educate us. Like, tell right. us more about this. So I set that up. Um, and then um, the competitor had a conference in Boston for three days. Uh, it was around this time of year. And I went to the conference, again, just to learn, to network. And um, by then, I'd had some interviews with them, gaining a little bit of traction while I was there. Met with some people at Mendix as well. and. Um, so again, this is moving along. You just keep learning, keep keep uh, putting my name out there on on this topic, and then in November I get an email, um, a LinkedIn request from a Mendix employee in the UK, mm -hmm. and he just sends the standard invite. I accept and say thank you, love your company, have a great day. Yeah. And he writes back. He said, Oh, I noticed you had a meetup on this topic. You know, I'd love to have a conversation. Sure. I said, I'd love to have a conversation too, in full transparency, I'm looking for a position in this ecosystem, either mm. with the Magic Quadrant, yeah. with clients, or with partners. And, you know, if that's, as long as you know that, sure. I'm absolutely up for a conversation. Right. And so, I will never forget how he responded. He said, leave it to me, I will speak to my senior management, we will have a meeting next week. Yeah. Six weeks later, I'm working at Mendix. There you go. That's it like was, a that's like fairy tale too. It was. I mean, well, you know, luck favors yeah. prepared. I will sure. say that. Yeah. I mean, you put so, in the time. Yeah. So when uh, because of all that research I'd done in low mm -hmm. code, when I got on that call the next week, and unbeknownst to me, my future manager joined us on that call. Mm -hmm. um, so we were on this call, the three of us, and had a great conversation because I'd done my homework, mm -hmm. and so. My future manager and I continued the conversation the next day. Um, they asked me to do some work on the software online, which I did. And then I was flown into Boston for seven interviews and I present yeah, on the software. Right. And um, it's so different. Like again, when you apply online, you get into this Hermione Granger mode. Mm -hmm. And when you interview, like, yes, yes, uh, yes, I can do that. Right. And you're just trying to please, trying to do that. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you take this interview bucket list approach, I think it's just um, more dignified. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's You've got a lot more control. And it just it's a whole different mindset and just a, so far more satisfying. You've really done enough homework to understand, will this culture be um, yeah. the, my culture? So they did make an exception and made my position remote. And it's really been yeah. such a great ride.
Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. You know, <laughs> I, it's good. It's good to hear, and it's also good to add legitimacy, legitimacy in my head mm-hmm. to to some of these more like esoteric roles or what I view as just like even I remember years ago somebody was like, "Well, I'm in business development." You know, I'm like, "What is that? Yeah, like, what is you, that? Do you sell something? Yeah. What do you do?" And like, "No, no, no, I'm not sales. I'm, I'm BD." I'm like, "What do you do? Like, I don't understand what you do, right?" right and it wasn't right. until I really like talked to somebody, like, "Oh, you do have a real job." Yeah, you do have a real in, job. In the SMB market or the mid market that I, I tend to play in, mm-hmm. uh, that there is no real space for BD, no. right? Nope. Right, you had, to, you had to kind of be a more enterprise company. So yeah. when I saw customer success manager for the first time, I'm like, but what do you really do? What do you, right? really, what do you do? really do? We secure the recurring. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's that was my tagline when I um, chose that role in my email. Uh, my, uh, my signature line is securing the recurring. Yeah. Because I, I do that. I mean, I can um, take somebody who's ready to churn and understand why they're ready to churn and say, you know what, I totally understand that perspective, um, but you might not realize we've been doing this, this, and this since then, mm-hmm. which might address your concerns. And then they, uh, especially then when they become one of our greatest advocates, oh, it's like a drug I can't get enough right. of. Right, yeah, mm-hmm. and that's, that's how you build your business. Yeah. And, you know, now I'm sure that you you are firmly placed into your, your ecosystem as you uh, wanted to be, correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I am. I really, yeah. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I definitely have employers who reach out to me in the ecosystem, mm-hmm. uh, wanting to be introduced to universities and students. Um, uh, I have students who, I, I have a blog post on, you know, how to enhance your LinkedIn profile once you have a Mendix certification, mm-hmm. because a lot of, um, you know, a lot of college students still don't understand the v- value of LinkedIn. And so uh, for me to let them know that, you know, recruiters are on LinkedIn all day long, Mm -hmm. all day long. That's all they do. And if you are not there, it is like going to, you know, an old school hotel job fair. And you've got one room full of recruiters and one room with none. Mm -hmm. By not being on LinkedIn, you're walking into the empty room. So you, you know, and then you have to use it like you mean it, Mm -hmm. not just because one of your classes required it. Um, Right. So... Take that opportunity, take any of those certifications, and don't just put it in the certification slot of LinkedIn. You have multiple places where you can put that. So I'll share that blog post with every single certified student. Um, mm-hmm. And and they've really been, you know, appreciative by and large. Yeah. Um, I've had a few that say, oh, you know, it was great to learn in college, but I don't think I'm going to be using it in the future. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, that, that's yeah. sweet. Different structure, different exactly. folks. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But you, I mean, you, you were writing articles on LinkedIn also and yes. publishing them, yeah. right? So well, you're, I, yeah. I was, an early, I was a, a pretty early adopter of LinkedIn yeah. um, because I just, to me, it was purposeful, mm-hmm. um, which is, which was more important to me than other uh, platforms. And like Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, so, and also I would just learn so much more. Um, so I could learn and, you know, hopefully people could learn from me a little bit. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's interesting. You know, I, I actually noticed that more business people are, are adding me on Facebook now. Oh, okay. And there's like business groups on Facebook, mm-hmm. and they are awful. Uh, okay. I, 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 I mean, they just they just are. You know, I didn't mean to go on this tangent, but like, in LinkedIn, there's business groups, and mm-hmm. it's like you know, cloud computers of yes. Ohio or AI, and I love them because yes. it's it's meaningful dialogue. Right. Uh, back in the the old internet days when it was forums, there and had a username. Mm-hmm. You had this. You had. Anonymity, right? Yes. You, you were you, you had a mask, mm-hmm. and so it made sense when people were horrible to each other, at yeah. least to some extent, because there were really no penalties. Right. Facebook, I see you and your family yeah. in the picture, right? Trolling us on uh, on Blockland, yeah. right? That's like the page that comes to mind where it's yeah. like you say something and it just spirals out of control, whereas right. you just don't have that dialogue on yeah. LinkedIn, right? But it's right. Uh, it's super interesting to me because I remember looking at that, going like, why are these like? Your name's attached to yeah. it, right? But LinkedIn yeah. has always, I, I like that you said LinkedIn was purposeful because yes. I, really, I really do agree with that. I mean, there are a few times, and again, with our stu- with um, students, I would definitely remind them. I said, you know what, if you, especially if you are transitioning to this IT world, this is not the time to post things that are irrelevant to that mm-hmm. um, because you're trying, if you really are all in, then show show me. Yeah. But if your posts have you all over the place, then I'm I'm not convinced that this is really where you are planning on digging in. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. <laughs> so I believe that without looking at my notes once, yes. I've kind of gone through just about anything. Uh, well, actually, there's one thing. Sure. So uh, when when thank you JJ for for recommending you to Thanks. me. Uh, JJ does a lot of work to. 
uh, kind of bring up women in tech. One mm -hmm. of my issues with this podcast has always been trying to get more women to, to yes. come on. And JJ and I, if you, if you listen to that yes. podcast, a little bit of dialogue on why that might be, yes, right? Sure. Like women like data and like, you know, asking and being more tentative. Right. What is your advice for women going into tech? Sure. Uh, women maybe think about going on this podcast, right? right in general, just yeah. like just interfacing with technology because again, I do go to a lot of tech events, yes. and on the very technically inclined ones, there are a bunch of white dudes and yep. hoodies in the corner. Yep. And when it's more of a social event, there's a bunch of white dudes in suits in the corner. Yes. So how do we how do we right. bring more women into the sure. equation? So it's a couple of things. I would um, use the example of you know Notre Dame College locally mm -hmm. when they decided to um, to go uh, co-ed. Mm -hmm. What did they, do you remember what they did? I don't. Uh, one of the things they did was they I think either they started a men's soccer team or a men's football team. Yeah. So they didn't just recruit one or two onesie twosies. Mm -hmm. So when you have a social event like that, it's easier yeah. for women or anybody really to not walk in and be the only one in the room mm -hmm. of their yeah, very kind. very frequently. So um, so that's part of it. I mean, take a few women can do it, but it's not really the, the easiest thing in the world. It, but, uh, like and from a from a masculine standpoint, yeah. I I see how it, like I wouldn't I wouldn't want to. Be singled right. out like that because yes. I also see the negative aspects yes. of that, right? And right. even even at the like, places I've worked, where there's like for every fifty yeah. male software developers, there's right. two female, and sure. there's you, you need to have uh, good representation. You right. have to have a, a group to yes share ideas with. So um, there are a lot of, I mean, I'll, I'll try to winnow down a few. So mm -hmm. first of all, to get women on this podcast easy, I yeah. can give you several names. Right, that's, um, that's if, word of mouth, yes, that's how okay. we do it, thank so, you. Um, and so I was really yeah. amazed that, you know, I was invited and I'm thinking, oh, I'm thinking of what about, you know, Susan and what about, um, uh, you know, um, Emma and a few others that have far more um, depth in this field. But you still have a very interesting story, right? We still we still well, had really you. good dialogue. Good, I'm yeah. glad we had fun. Yeah. Um, but certainly, so mm -hmm. there are certainly um, people I can connect you with. Mm -hmm. So we'll solve that problem quickly. Sure. So now, overall, women in IT. Here are some things. Um, don't just ask once. Ask mm -hmm. multiple times. Yeah. Here's a story. So um, my. Um, my husband is such an advocate for women in tech, and he's going to be really embarrassed that I've mentioned his name here, but I, I'm, not, I, I'm going to. Yeah, single him out. Yes. So he has been volunteering for eight years mm -hmm. in um, East Cleveland at a food pantry slash clothing distribution center. Mm -hmm. And because they are, I hope I got this all right, honey, um, because they are funded by the diocese and the food bank, mm -hmm. they keep careful track of records, so people can only come once a month to get benefits there. Mm -hmm. And so that first system that was developed was developed by one of the volunteers. She um, was a math teacher and she developed an access database to track all of this. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and then they ultimately grew and had their own software. So she transitioned everything and done all, had done all the hardware, wiring, everything to keep this place running for over eight years purely as a volunteer. Over these eight years, my husband kept telling her, you should be a developer, you should be a developer. Mm -hmm. You have everything it takes yeah. to be a developer. Um, it wasn't until May of this year that, and then he also said, and you need to talk to my wife about helping, you know, right. uh, get this. So she did all the heavy lifting. I won't, um, and I just pointed and gave her a couple of pointers here and there. And she actually, she and JJ definitely connected. Mm -hmm. That definitely helped. Um, she landed this, um, the middle of August and her goal was the end of July. So we're sure. only two weeks off, but she landed a 19 minute commute developer job nice, um, you know, in the salary she was expecting, and um, so, but it took eight years. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta. Um, that, that's one example. Most of them don't. Other examples I've seen is... Um, well, pause that right sure. now. Why on earth would your husband be embarrassed by that? That's exclusively oh, good on well, him. Oh, no. He just, you know, he just, you know, he yeah. he doesn't talk about his volunteer work. Yeah. You know, it's, it's... Well, he's been singled out now. Yeah, he has. <laughs> Sorry, um, but, I mean, so that's that's yeah. very typical. And he, will, he has done the same yeah. in the workplace. So as a man in the workplace, when you see a woman who has just a, you see some potential... Yeah. Don't stop by just asking once. Mm -hmm. Keep asking. Okay. Keep, and, and then be specific about, you know what, I'd like to send you to Scrum Master Training. Mm -hmm. I'd like to send you here. I need you to present. On, if, if, they, if they like presenting, if it doesn't terrify them, use the presenting as an excuse to stretch their skills to be ready for a presentation. Yeah. So those would be some ways I would do that. Um, uh, a Duolingo did a great job. Uh, they said our goal is 50-50 
hiring, mm -hmm. um, gender hiring. Have you read that article? It is, yeah, and that, that's also the goal of this podcast: yes. is 50-50 okay. gender gender guests. Well, yeah. so um, so if you that po uh, that that particular blog yeah, is incredibly yeah. valuable. Um, what shocks me is how many, and I know JJ, JJ yeah. gave you this example: how few companies redact resumes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that to me is such a no-brainer. Yeah. Somebody built uh, some software for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so redacting is huge. Yeah. I mean, look what that did for orchestras. Mm -hmm. You know, once they put a screen up and had auditions blindly, um, the they went from all male orchestras to um, to decent representation by mm -hmm. women in orchestras. So we can do the same. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with we found that women who had a GitHub handle that made it clear they were women. Yeah, um, yeah. It ended up having uh, code that was not accepted as frequently as men when we really? would offer code um, in, into open systems. So I advise my students pick something gender neutral when you pick mm -hmm. a GitHub handle, because why why hurt yourself yeah. in ways that might not be clear? The other thing that are you familiar with stereotype threat? No. Okay, this is a really interesting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So stereotype. Stereotype threat was identified, I can't exactly remember when, but the key thing that kind of launched the, the field was when they, um, when they took the AP calculus exam and took a question on the front page, what is your gender, and put it to the back page. Mm -hmm. The number of women who then scored above a four on the AP calculus exam was a significant difference. Really? It was. So I know people look at that like, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, well, they repeated this. There's more. Yeah, yeah. So they repeated this in multiple ways. They repeated this with, um, I want to save my best example for last. Okay. Um, so they repeated it regarding, you know, um, any other kinds of situations like this. Sure. So let's say, for example, they had a room, they had students who walked into a room of, like women walking into a room of men taking a math test. Scores were lower than when they walked into a room with all women. Okay. All right. Um, white people who walked into a room with uh, taking a math test with Asian people. Mm -hmm. Their scores went down. Okay. Okay. So now take now here's my uh, my favorite example that I learned from Lisa Demore at uh, Laurel School. Um, they, uh, so most people are like, ah, sure, sure. So this is a Lisa Demore study. This is a Lisa. Okay. Well, this is, this is where I learned it from okay, Lisa okay. Demore. Yeah. Um, because she studies this phenomena, and one of the um, the my favorite example was when white guys go into a gym, they get measured on long jump, high jump. You know, they've got those numbers. They come back the next time. This time, the room is filled with African American men. Mm -hmm. Their scores go down. The white men. Yeah. Okay. So the point is that stereotype threat means that sometimes, or oftentimes, mm -hmm. un unbeknownst to us, when we walk into a situation where we believe that we are less than the group that's there for whatever is going to be measured, mm -hmm. that there is a high probability that we will underperform compared to being in a different setting. So, so, so I understand. So what happens is the people actually are performing worse, but they're performing worse because they're seeing somebody that they think will just naturally perform better than them based on that stereotype. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That does that. That makes that makes a lot more sense. So, um, so that stereotype threat speaks to what you just described. When, sure. You know, when you go to events, whether yeah. they're social or professional, and um, you know, you you know, again, you have to. You know, I'll tell you, when I went to that Boston conference, mm -hmm. you know, I thought, I'm going to be the oldest person here. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be, you know, a lot of, you know, I'll, I'll be one of the few women. There has to be people lower than 30. Oh, bless your heart. <laughs> um, but I will say, I went yeah. there, and um, it was wildly diverse. Okay. Diverse from countries, diverse mm -hmm. from age, diverse um, from, you know, skin tones, mm -hmm. uh, gender. I, it was a, a much more diverse group than I would have expected. Um, but I was bracing myself, and I knew I'd have right. to be brave to go yeah. in. Um, and, and it was easier than I had expected, but it, that's not always the case. And so anything we can do, all those things you hear about, you know, somebody sitting at the corner of the room, pull them up to the table. Um, somebody interrupts somebody, let them finish saying it. Uh, if you know in advance that kind of happens, um, you know, make a pact to kind of have their back and repeat what they have to say before it gets covered up. So all those things that are about inclusiveness and belonging really are valuable.
and yeah. and they um, and people notice those things, and they also notice who's the one to 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 have their back. So all those things, the the sponsoring, the mentorship, the don't stop asking once is all gonna gonna bring people to the table that historically have either counted themselves out or IT has counted them out. Yeah, no, that was that's 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 really good insight. I think that moving forward, we need to do a much better job. And and there's there's all sorts of other like areas where I've seen uh, missing the mark in terms, especially in terms of just getting young people into IT. Not yeah. necessarily oh. even young women, but just young people. Absolutely. It's like thirty percent of them want to be influencers. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, I, I, you know, I, and I've, I've been on boards that hosted events in yeah. Cleveland that the whole thing was talking to young students yeah. and the way like I get that sometimes uh, technology can be unsexy. Yes. But uh, man, do they make it as unappealing as possible at some of these things where exactly. it's like, you know, are you good at math? No, then get out. Yeah. I'm like, whoa, 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 this is you're trying to sell this. <laughs> like, it's, it's, let's slow down there. Right. right? Exactly. You know, because I'm not good at math and I've been in IT my whole life. So. That's, that's I yeah. have a calculator. You will figure uh, it out. Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, the the president of oh I can't remember if it's Pomona College or Claremont College um, when she came on board and she has now raised up. Uh, so you probably know the statistic, but back in 1984, 37 percent of computer science degrees were conferred to women. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we're at 18 mm percent, -hmm. and that's been flatlined. Mm -hmm. Now somebody could just say, well, they're just not good at STEM. Well, if that were true, let's take a look at the other STEM fields. Women are mm -hmm. um, doing very well in the medical field. We they're, are. They're all going to doctorates exactly. and, and biotech. And so I wonder, this is just an absolute yeah. personal um, observation of mine, I wonder a lot of those fields have some kind of credentialing. You have to take the MCATs. You have to pass the boards. You have to do all these things. Where software actually snubs its nose at credentials a lot of times. Yeah. I mean, you get credentials on the hardware side with Cisco, and that's valuable. But on the software side, you're almost considered like a, um, you know, uh, an amateur if you get those, or you're just trying to rack them up without um, any experience. And so I wonder if we had had some of those credentials available on the software side, where women could prove. That mm -hmm. you know what we can do this just as much as just as well as you can, and we have in the past. I wonder if that would have made a difference in the trend that we're seeing. It's possible, you know. Aside from obviously fortify your data, I work at Blue Bridge, and one of the things we do is we have like a test mm -hmm. that just it's just pass the test and you're in, right? Yes. We obviously there, we do some vetting before you get there, right. but uh, I think that that is a very intimidating thing for a lot of people. Yes, where it is. you know, and, and and I think the philosophy that we have is. Listen, if you can't pass the test, then you, you know, right. you know, if you don't think you can pass the test, then you're not going to make it here. Yeah. Know, we don't care where you came from. Right. If you can do this, yes. if you can prove that you can do this, then right. you're in. Uh, see uh, that high stakes question. <laughs> right. But oh. I, like, we, we, I, I, you can just see people just like, just n not show up. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, and I think that that approach mm -hmm. might also be, uh, What's might, what might scare off some women where it's like, you know, right. did you, you do this test? Like, yes. and it's not, it's not, it's not like a multiple choice test. It's right. a, what's the answer, right? Yeah. There's a show your work kind right. of thing. So. Mm -hmm. No, um, I mean, it, it, if it's timed, that makes it even worse. Mm -hmm. So making it untimed is one yeah. option. Um, we turn the heat in the room up to 90, oh, high there, humidity. Thank yeah. you, thank you. That's very important. I'm so glad those yeah. studies how, how have come good, out. How good are you in stressful situations? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think... Um, you know, testing can be stressful for, yeah. for a lot of folks. Um, again, if you've already got stereotype threat feelings coming in, mm -hmm. um, you might have those compounded with the test. So if that, you know, if you've only seen men as you've walked in mm -hmm. and then you've got this test, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I guess my question would be, is it possible? I know you don't have huge staff um, yeah. at Blue Bridge, but what if, you know, what would happen if you hired somebody who didn't take the test um, in a different position and groom them to the point where you knew that they could, you've seen their work that you didn't need the test. Yeah, certainly we've done that in the past. Okay. I think that we have, uh, we have a, like, and, and again, this is, this is just pertaining to Bluebirds. We have a really hard time hiring entry level people in oh, general sure. because we don't really have entry level tasks. Right. So, uh, what happens, we will do like internships and then kind of say, here's your internship. You know what we do. Yes. Go to another place yes. for a couple of years and then we'll recruit you back. Right. Uh, you know, we are we are a smaller staff too, so it kind of turns into a you know we don't have we don't have time for that junior person. Right. No, I understand. Right. I hear that from a lot of people. I really do. Yeah. And so, when larger companies have a pipeline for mm -hmm. talent that way, and they whether it's Eaton in their early talent program yeah. or others, mm -hmm. that's great. So my question is. 
for small to mid-sized companies, is there no way for them you know, to get together, whether it's the Tri-C Corporate College, and say, you know what, we have X number of openings next year, and we need to have skills A through whatever, mm -hmm. and here are ways we need you to demonstrate that they actually have these skills. I mean, can't we get together and have like a collective way to solve the problem for small to medium-sized businesses? There, there are some efforts. Okay. There are some efforts. I, I don't. I have not seen results okay. per se. No, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there aren't results, but again, I think that uh, at least in the Cleveland ecosystem, there's mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of mid-market going mm -hmm. around, and again, most of the mid-market firms really you can have like maybe one or two entry-level guys, and yeah. you need to have 30, 40 people working. Yeah. Right, and so it's hard to set up one of those programs yes. if you don't have the positions available. Right. So then, you know, and then all those people do go to Eaton, Sherman Williams, Rockwell Automation, yeah. Highland, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And and you just kind of have to wait to pick them off from there. Yeah. Right. No, I do. So, I understand that. We definitely saw that strategy. Yeah. 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 So and that's it, it's it works fine. You know, I would say that a, a bigger part of our strategy has been recruiting from far away, yeah. you know, but then you deal with, you know, if you're not paying a recruitment fee, you're paying a um, relocation package. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. there's all, there's, that's a, that's a whole other can of worms, right? Right, right. So, yeah, yeah. so well, we are, we are yeah. nearing the end of our time for sure. This um, has been a treat. Yeah. Is, is there any parting thoughts you want to share? Anything you want to plug? That's a great question. I mean, I think I've done my fair share of plugging, you know, how awesome <laughs> Mendix is. It really is. Yeah, I do yeah. love working there. Um, I would also just, again, I will tell you one thing I see. I take a lot of Ubers, mm -hmm. um, whether, you know, because of travel or whatever, and I see Uber drivers that are so underemployed. Mm -hmm. And I realize they're probably, there are two, one thing they tell me, they love it because of the flexibility. They get to be their own boss. Nobody tells them where to go. There's no office politics, all that stuff. I get that part. But the other part is you are, if you are unemployed, in three days you can drive and start making money. Mm -hmm. There's no humiliation involved mm -hmm. in trying to find a job. So it's a lot easier to start doing that. You're getting some cash, it's way below what you could be making. Mm -hmm. But because um, the process can be so difficult, because um, looking for a job can be so stressful, you would rather go for something quick like that. And I understand it, I do. Um, but I, I guess I would encourage all those folks, if you are doing that, you know whether it's Uber or anything else, and you're going for the for the short versus the long. At least um, invest a little bit of your time for the long, mm -hmm. even if you have to do all that short stuff for whatever reason. But um, start watching YouTube videos on IT on intros to. Um, you hear a word you don't know instead of saying I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. um, look it up and it just. Just be more curious about IT. That's the final answer. Be more curious. Yeah, there's more, curious. there's more in there than you think. Mm -hmm. There are places for you that you might not even realize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So love Mendex. <laughs> be curious. Fortify your data. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Thank you Michael. Very much. Yeah.